Welcome to Lit Crit as Fuck, the audio experience in which I say shit about stuff and you listen to junk. Previously on this awkward audio experience, Yvonne made everybody really sad. And where's Dimitri? Uh, anybody seen Dimitri? No? Well, you're not gonna see him now. Title card. The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Part 6. The one where I get in an argument with the book. So I need to rewind a bit. Back to... Yvonne and Alyosha at the tavern. It's kind of hard to tell what Yvonne really means ever. I'm pretty certain I know what he means here. When he says that he would rather believe in nothing at all than in a god who would sit by and let innocent children suffer. Yvonne is responding to Alyosha saying, well, Jesus has the right to forgive people who do horrible things to children with the Grand Inquisitor story. Here on Earth where humans are in charge, Jesus has no power. So bringing his name up is pointless. He's not here. He's not doing anything. Where is the justice? He wants to know. Yvonne wants to know where is justice. I must have justice, he says. Who cares if Jesus forgives some asshole for doing unspeakable shit to children? How does that help? And don't sinners get judged accordingly? Isn't that what hell is for? But there's no justice in the suffering of yet more people just because they go to hell for doing shitty stuff because God made us this way in the first place. Plus, Yvonne doesn't want more suffering. He wants less suffering. Like, zero suffering would be great, please. What kind of a person imagines a child being abused, then takes solace in the fact that the abuser will suffer an eternity of torture? Like, oh sure, a five-year-old was beaten to death by his own father, but at least the father is going to have his eternal soul tormented forever and ever. That is some sick shit right there. That is injustice. I mean, at best, that's revenge. And that is what Christianity offers. That is what God offers. Yvonne would rather chaos if this is the price of order. Yvonne would rather hell if this is the price of heaven. It doesn't matter if God exists. That doesn't make those innocent children's suffering any less. Jesus' ability to forgive some bad guys, that doesn't undo it either. The price is too high. So Yvonne responds with this elaborate and enigmatic epic poem that he never wrote down. He came up with it at some point and it's in his head and um, it doesn't rhyme or, you know, have any sort of poetic meters. Um, why it's an epic poem is one of those things that, you know, just go with it because we have bigger problems. With this story he argues jesus ain't gonna save us from ourselves he's not gonna do anything about the problems we face in our day-to-day lives jesus isn't intervening with abusive parents to stop them from hurting their kids he's not turning stones to bread to feed people jesus is irrelevant so bringing him into a conversation about life in the material world is just an empty appeal to authority also dostoevsky hated and simultaneously did not understand socialism like at all. The Grand Inquisitor is definitely a critique of socialism in Dostoevsky's world, but I don't care because in order for that to track, you have to pretend that the Christians in this book aren't just full-on socialists. And also, when it comes to literary criticism, my philosophy is summed up this way. If the author's dead and I'm still alive, I win. He can't say I'm wrong, so he loses. Dostoevsky's dead. I win. His critique of socialism is dumb and I'm ignoring it. Cause I can, cause he lost. Dostoevsky gets one thing right. And that is that um, human beings are corrupt and institutions run by human beings are corrupt. The Grand Inquisitor is giving them a fake God to believe in rather than like the real one. Um, But, and he's taking away their freedom by making them dependent on the church. Really, that's what he's doing. He's making them dependent on the church. So, I mean, okay, I get it. Look, I get it. All right, Dostoevsky, I get it. What you're trying to say is that if we had a government that was like, look, I can give you food and money and like material things to make your life easier, we're still going to suffer. So, you know, and that those that government people is going to be corrupt because humans are corrupt and especially ones in power. Yeah, you're right. You're super right. I will give you that. Okay? But you're still dead and you still lose. So Yvonne 
simply wins the argument by being like, yeah, that's a logical fallacy we like to call an appeal to authority. Nice try though, buddy. And then we get into Zosima's chapters. And do you know what Zosima's chapters are? Oh, they're appeals to authority. They are full on hardcore appeals to authority. But they're pretty and they and they make you cry a little bit. And you and he's nice. So you're like, oh, I don't I know. This isn't logical debates. This is like feeling and um stuff. It's a fictional novel and none of these are real people. Oh, also, it just became Christmas. It's 12 a.m. on the 25th. Huh. This is awesome. Dude, I'm so punk rock. I am literally talking about the Grand Inquisitor as it strikes 12 on um the fake birthday of Jesus. The day when nobody actually celebrates Jesus. I mean, let's let's be honest. This is the celebration of all the things that Susim is opposed to. This is an interesting, this might be kind of an interesting thing to say now that I'm saying it out loud. That like, uh, you know, this whole consumerism thing. Oh, he goes into that. Zosima goes full into that. He not not fond of it. The religious side of this, he, they're not going like, yeah, go spend money. No, no. Oh, no, no, no. See, the material world stuff. Oh, that's bad. Oh, God. If he saw Black Friday, like Zosima would just die all over it again. Black Friday would make him die inside. Shouldn't religion make us better people? Oh, God, it doesn't. We've used it to murder and also um, steal you know, and, and like pig pile on other people in order to try to get the last PlayStation. Like this is what is happening here. The, you know, it, it's fun that it's currently Christmas. Let's get to the actual chapters, shall we? Father Zosima takes Alyosha aside while um, the people are all gathering. And Zosima asks Alyosha if he has spoken to his brother. And Alyosha's like, which brother? And Zosima's like, you know, the one that I bowed down to. Zosima believes that he saw something in Dimitri's eyes that tells of his future and that it will be filled with lots of suffering. I mean, I feel like you could just say that about anybody and it might kind of be true. But to be fair, he's super right. Alyosha is like I haven't talked to him I tried to talk to him yeah I don't know where he is right now he just isn't around and so Seema says you know well after I die you gotta go and you gotta talk to your brother you, maybe you can stop whatever is gonna happen from happening and Elias is like could you be less vague though maybe and so Seema's like nope just go figure out what bad thing is gonna happen and make it not happen and Elias is like yes sir I will do that and then it segues into Sosima telling everybody why it is that he loves Alyosha so very much. And it is because Alyosha reminds him of his brother. When Father Zosima was nine years old, his 17-year-old brother died of tuberculosis. As he was deteriorating toward the end of his life, Zosima's brother started to become kind of a hippie. He said things like that we are all responsible for each other in every possible way. We are responsible for each other's actions. We are responsible to each other. Let's all hold hands and sing. Kumbaya, motherfuckers. He just kept saying these very like poetic, flowery things about loving your neighbor and equality. And the doctor was like, yeah, it's gone to his brain. I always think this is really funny. He's actually saying these beautiful things. And the doctor's like, oh, the prognosis is that uh, he's definitely crazy. He's talking about serving his servants. What's that about? But anyways, Zosima's brother had a bit of a impact on him. The effects Zosima's brother had on him didn't really blossom until later on in life. You know, he planted a seed and the seed slowly did what seeds do until they are not seeds anymore or something. Look, I don't know how science works. So um, after his brother died, his mother decided to send him to the cadet corps so he could become an officer and have a good income. And it's her only son now. And his father's been dead for a while. So it's just the two of them. And she's like, this is the best thing for him. And so he goes to the cadet corps and he becomes kind of a dick. His mom dies uh, about three years in. His whole family is dead now. So he falls in love with this woman and she's already married. And so he decides that he is going to challenge challenge her husband to a duel even though she's not interested in him at all so yeah that's awesome and heroic then he beats his servant he has a servant and he just beats him and he feels bad about it he's getting prepared for this duel and he's like you know something feels off 
I don't know if I'm hungry. Why do I feel weird? And he's like, well, is it because I'm afraid to go and duel somebody with guns and maybe die? No, nah, that's not it. And then he realizes it's because he beat his servant. And I'm like, well, I mean, why wasn't that your initial instinct anyways? Like to feel bad that you did that. And then everything kind of dawns on him. He sees his brother's face in his mind's eye and he suddenly all of his brother's crap starts rushing back to him and he just cries and he goes to his servant and he's so sorry and then he goes to the duel and he lets the guy shoot at him one time because if he didn't do that then they'd think he was afraid and he doesn't want people to think he's afraid he wants them to understand that he's doing this because he's had a, an epiphany he lets the guy shoot at him and he misses and then Zosima is like I don't want to do this duel and he throws his gun and the guy that he challenged who had just shot at him is like what the crap i didn't want to do this in the first place but you kind of insisted on it and now you're like just kidding and and so seems like yeah i know i was a jerk yesterday but i'm better today and the guy said the actually guy has like a funny little line where he's like well i agree with the first part and then uh Zosima tells everybody that he's gonna become a monk and the, everybody's like oh okay well then that explains everything and he leaves the army and he becomes a monk as a young monk he's living in the little town and he makes a new friend the guy just kind of starts showing up and hanging out and they're talking about life and then one day the guy's like so way back in the day i totally murdered this woman because she wasn't in love with me and i was in love with her right that's messed up and i didn't really care about doing it like i didn't feel bad about it for like a long time i was totally okay with it but then like i got married and had kids and now i feel like i should probably feel bad about this what how am i gonna ha- raise my son to be a good person when i'm like a murderer and you know that's a good question and so you know zosima convinces him that he has to go and confess it's like the only thing you can do at this point right um that or you could just keep pretending i guess so the guy keeps coming back and he hasn't confessed yet because he really doesn't he's terrified to do that and he's worried about his kids are gonna be like oh my father's a murderer that sucks and his wife what's she gonna do but finally the guy's like all right i'll do it so apparently the night that the man decided that he was gonna turn himself in he came one last time to zosima and then he really quickly left and he acted a little bit weird and he was like remember that i came back just keep that in mind it's gonna come up again so the guy looks like crazy pants when he goes in and he's like um remember that murder that happened 20 years ago and you guys thought you found the guy who did it and that guy died in prison and so the case got closed remember that and they're like yeah why and he's like well that was really me i was the one who did that they're like um are you sure though so in real pure dostoevsky fashion this guy gets really sick probably brain fever i don't remember it's always some kind of brain fever but he does and he goes and he confesses and nobody believes him everyone's like oh he's just crazy poor guy so sima doesn't see him for a while because um his wife is like i don't like that guy you've been talking to him and he's a bad influence on you so so sima can't come to see him while he's sick for a while but then he finally gets to because the guy's dying and remember how the guy came back like the night before he confessed and he was like hey Hey, remember I came back one last time? Well, he tells Zosima before he dies that he was going to kill him because Zosima was the only one who actually knew about the murder. And he thought, well, if I kill him, then no one will know. And also he'll stop trying to get me to turn myself in and then I won't have to turn myself in. But then he decides he's not going to do it. And he was like, hey, you should know that you were never closer to being murdered than you were in that moment because I was like totally going to murder you. But then I decided not to murder you. And then they have a good laugh, freeze frame. So after Zosima finishes his stories, he gets a little preachy with it. He gives a bit of a sermon, really, about what it is to be a monk and why being a monk is great. The answer is because monks live ascetic lives and can't be tempted by earthly things. It's really kind of difficult to understand why this is such an important thing, but apparently it is. If you put a monk in prison, a monk would not suddenly need its cigarettes. So I guess that's better. I don't know. And then he talks about how that servant that he beat up way back when he was an officer, they met up kind of by chance and it was this beautiful thing. At this point, they'd become equals in the sense that neither of them was a master or a servant. And this is like a way of showing, you know, see, this can happen. It's possible for people to go from being a master and a servant to being equals. So does everybody need to become a monk? No. What he's saying is that monks need to lead by example. And that monks need to be teachers of the people and show the people the goodness that they are capable of. Now I have a quote because I'm doing that now. Why should not my servant be like my own kindred so that I may take him into my family and rejoice in doing so? 
Even now this can be done, but it will lead to the grand unity of men in the future when a man will not seek servants for himself. So through acting as though people are equal, we will create equality. You know, the philosophy of be the change you want to see. If we start treating servants as if they're just people, at some point there won't be servants. It seems a little bit idealistic and kind of naive, frankly, but whatever. Next. So I have a, the next quote here is, and can it be a dream, as in, can this really not be true, that in the end, man will find his joy only in deeds of light and mercy and not in cruel pleasures as now. Yeah, sure. Sounds nice. It's just empty hopefulness. But, you know, I like feeling good and, you know, sometimes believing things can get better. So, yeah, that's whatever. It isn't an answer or a plan. It's just more, hey, have hope, guys, and do good stuff. Fine, that's great. Okay. Next quote. And if our hope is a dream, when will you build up your edifice and order things justly by your intellect alone without Christ. He's talking to the filthy nihilists and atheists out there. If they declare that it is they who are advancing toward unity, only the most simple-hearted among them can believe it, so that one may positively marvel at such simplicity. It's like, atheists are stupid if they think that they can create a better world without Jesus. But also, this is a terrible argument, and here's why. He's saying that, you know, we haven't gotten there to this perfect utopia with your intellect alone without God. We haven't gotten there with God either dude. So Christianity's been around way longer than nihilism at this point. Um, to argue that being scientific and an atheist will not bring about anything good because it hasn't yet is really just dumb. I'm going to give him back his argument of, well, you're dumb for thinking that. But it's dumb because, look, he seems to be totally leaving out the amount of terrible stuff done in the name of Christ. Yvonne only really just alludes to it by having his poem take place during the Spanish Inquisition. And even that kind of feels like... Like, oh, well, you know, the Catholic Church is terrible, sure, but that doesn't count. And the idea that his argument can be, without Jesus, you can't actually create a better world. You haven't done it yet. Well, neither have you. I feel like that can easily just be thrown right back at you. So the next quote, they aim at justice, but denying Christ, they will end by flooding the earth with blood. Whoa, shit just took a turn. Clearly directed back at Yvonne. This is Dostoevsky going back like, hey, they want justice, but they're not going to get it because they don't have God. Yvonne says, I want justice and not God. Now, they aim at justice. My assumption is that means that like justice would actually equal killing. Now, <laughs> that's the thing. And here's the next quote. And if it were not for Christ's covenant, they would slaughter one another down to the last two men on earth. And then there's a whole thing about how those two men would then kill each other and one of them, you know, whatever. So he takes that insane leap that Dostoevsky loved to take, which is to say that if people don't believe in God, they will just like murder each other all the time. There's just no basis for this. And frankly, people who do believe in God murder plenty. This is a very pretty part of the book. It makes you feel like maybe hopeful at times in contrast to Yvonne's chapters, which make you feel so very, very sad. But ultimately, it isn't offering anything beyond, hey guys, be good to each other, with a weird claim that somehow Jesus will make everything okay. It's very unsatisfying as an answer to why doesn't God stop bad stuff from happening? Because Zosima's answer is just like, uh, he does. And you're like, but the children are still suffering. And everybody is still suffering horribly. And it, that he's not, huh? His argument becomes just, but Jesus though. It's not an argument. It's not a refutation. It's a sermon. So I don't know what Dostoevsky was trying to accomplish exactly with this book. Like, I don't know what his aims were precisely. I think he had questions and concerns about life. I think he always did. And I think he wanted to ask them. I think he wanted to um, play them out. Maybe he was trying to make a point. But if so, it hardly seems like the point was Jesus will make everything better because Jesus hasn't done that. And he's had a lot of time to do that. And Yvonne actually points that out. So the existence of the Zosima chapters feel a little out of place and kind of like an attempt to cover his own ass after having his most compelling character go on for three chapters about how basically God is dead. If you're having the same concerns as Yvonne, Zosima's chapters, they're not going to answer those concerns. It's very beautiful. It's very beautifully written. You know, it's going to bring a tear to your eye and it's a fantasy and we love fantasy because Yvonne is right. Life sucks. 
and there is no order to it. I realize that this is going to be a weird statement, but if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we like to lie to ourselves. We like the fantasy. Yvonne doesn't want the fantasy. So the active love idea is that loving other people unconditionally, it's something to strive for, but n nobody really can do unless they are Zosima or Alyosha. Because Father Zosima and Alyosha are not based on actual humans. Zosima technically is based on somebody, but he's based on like a saint who Dostoevsky never met because he was way dead by the time Dostoevsky was alive. These aren't real people. These are idealistic characters. They're heroic unrealistic idealistic characters and there you have it that's the end of the purely philosophical non-action sections of this book i never thought i would be so happy to be close to to talking about Dimitri again. But as you can tell, this took me a long time to do. It's longer than a lot of the other episodes. And honestly, it's a lot of rambling and I still don't know if it makes any sense. I can't wait to tell you just what happened. And next time, that's what I'm going to do. Things are going to happen and people are going to like interact with each other. And Krishnik is back. And Alyosha's going to have a reaction to stuff. And we're going to finally meet Rakitin. He's the worst. I am so excited to talk about how much I hate Rakitin. I'm so excited to never have to talk about Father Zosima ever again. Spoiler alert. He died. He <laughs> died.